Good evening. Thank you so much. Uh, what a crowd. I, I was a little nervous um, earlier talking to my colleagues, wondering if we would have folks on this uh, blustery evening. But we are really, really grateful and humbled that so many people came out tonight to join us for our forum. Uh, before we get started, I would like to introduce a few folks and have them stand in the audience. Um, Senator Allison Clarkson is here with us this evening. <laughs> Senator-elect Larry Hart. <laughs> Representative Larry Sakowitz. Mike Del Checo, the president of Voz. And Brendan Krauss from the Agency of Human Services. He is the director of healthcare reform. If I missed anybody, uh, I apologize. Um, and I would like to take a moment and have all of the, our volunteer Gifford board members also stand. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, again, it's a pleasure to have you all here, and I would like to turn the microphone over to Gifford's uh, direct, uh, board chair, Vic Roboto. Thank you. I'm, <clears throat> I'm so happy to see so many people here this evening. This is really wonderful uh, for this important conversation. Um, I just have a few remarks to share with you. How about that? <laughs> okay. Um, the Gifford Board seeks to represent and give voice to the community we serve. We have an obligation to work in the best interest of the community, meaning that we work to assure that the services provided by Gifford are of the highest quality and appropriate to the needs. And we are open to new and different ways of serving the community as needs evolve, which they do. We strive to be good stewards of the resources available. But the hospital business is really tough. Most years have ended in the black, but some in the red. New opportunities we pursue need to be both medically sound and make good economic sense. So we agree with the Green Mountain Care Board that greater financial stability is needed among all Vermont hospitals, including Gifford. But we do not think that the recommendations for Gifford provided by the Oliver Wyman report are the wisest way to get there. And I'll leave it to Michael Costa, our new CEO and his team, to explain the specific reasons why that is the case and to outline what Gifford is committed to doing and exploring as an alternative. So now this, at this time, I'd like to turn the podium over to our new president and CEO, Michael Costa. Good evening. Good evening. Um, thank you so much. I'm honored to serve as the president and CEO of Gifford. And I only have a few remarks because tonight is about you. But just one quick note. When I interviewed at Gifford um, to take on this um, incredible opportunity, people kept telling me that this place in this community is different. And you never know during an interview what the 100% capital T truth is. And if anybody's been to our building, which I assume almost all of you have, and I assume a lot of you were born there or have had kids born there, there is a wall of pictures of our team members who've been there 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, and longer. And when you see the joy on those faces, you can't help but believe there is something different about this community and this organization. And if I needed another reminder of it, my goodness, the turnout tonight. 
This is an extraordinary show of support from members of our community and members of our team. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you, because we have tough work to do, but knowing how much this community and this team cares is extraordinarily helpful and gratifying. So thank you all. Um, you know, thank you to our board members, thank you to our patients, residents, and neighbors for joining tonight to talk about the future of healthcare in Vermont. And so tonight, we're going to hear from you. We want you to share why Gifford matters, what's important to you, what we're doing well, also what we could be doing better. Every healthcare organization in Vermont can and should do better. And then we want to hear about your concerns in a really uncertain time for healthcare in Vermont. I'll facilitate that conversation, but before we begin, let me share three key points. One, Gifford will lead in rural healthcare. So moving forward, we disagree with the Oliver Wyman report. We think the recommendations are not wise for our community. We have concerns about the data, but we're not going to get stuck in the findings of that report. Instead, Gifford is going to choose to actively shape the future of rural healthcare. And we're going to do that in collaboration with others. We are committed to working with our legislators, including those here tonight, the Scott administration and the Green Mountain Care Board. We're ready to work with them to tackle Vermont's significant challenges, demographic shifts, housing shortages, and access to affordable health care. We may not always agree. There's been a lot of vitriol about the report, but I know that everybody in this conversation has something in common. They all love Vermont, and we're going to work from that premise. And then number two, Gifford is going to improve financially, and the way we're going to do that is by expanding access to care. The report, as Vic said, is right. Right now is a very difficult time in the healthcare business. And many hospitals are struggling to generate enough revenue to generate a positive margin to put back into their business. And so when our team takes a look at our business, we think the right way to succeed financially is by doing what we've done best for a long time. And that's creating access to care. We're gonna focus on primary care access we think that people wait too long for appointments to see a primary care clinician. Um, we've set a goal with our team starting on day one when I came in, and we've increased primary care appointments by 19% over the last month. And we know that's continued um, over the last few weeks as well. We also are really focused on what I think is the real problem in healthcare and should be the focus of healthcare reform. That's getting people to the right care at the right place at the right time. Too often people are stuck in the wrong place. And so we have a tremendous partnership with Dartmouth Hitchcock, and we've asked to be part of their transfer call every day. So if you talk to Dartmouth, they know that they're full and they're struggling to serve the community. And there are people in their beds that don't need to be there. They could be getting great care at Gifford. And so every morning at 1015, our talented nurse leaders talk to Dartmouth and their members about how we can transfer people from Dartmouth to Gifford so they can treat people at Dartmouth who truly need that care and we can treat local people at Gifford who need our care. And if it's successful, and we've already started transferring patients, we're going to ask for the same thing from the University of Vermont Medical Center. We're gonna take a look at our surgery capacity. A lot of the data you see in Vermont is that people wait a long time for surgery. We have a lot of opportunities to treat people here and now. And so we're gonna to try to figure out what the barriers are to people getting the right type of surgical care. Also, I know one thing for certain, I am not the smartest person at Gifford. We have a really talented team and we challenged our managers, please come up with cost saving ideas that could help our organization and help Vermont. Our first attempt at this yielded 93 separate ideas. There is so much wisdom under our roof and very little of it comes from the C-suite. It's people that care for you every day and they know how to do their job. And so we're prioritizing those in moving rapidly to try to save money so we can invest it back into access to care, our emergency department, our inpatient units, and our birthing center. And then there are some hard choices to be made in healthcare. We've talked about refocusing our services. So some of you may be aware that we made the decision last week to end our urogynecology and chiropractic services. Now, urogynecology, we have wonderful urology and gynecology physicians, and we felt like we could take care of people the right way, even if we ended the urogynecology service line. With chiropractic care, 
it simply was no longer sustainable. The re world we live in with the Oliver Wyman report says that if you can't make something work, it might have to go away. And we are laser focused on keeping those core services that matter the most at Gifford. And so we've had to make some hard decisions. We're not looking to close any other service line, but I think it's fair to tell everybody that we're committed to making the hard choices necessary to make sure that Gifford is always there for you and your family. Now, my spouse, is not much into politics. And she said, why did you close the service line right before your community meeting? And I said, well, because I only have two choices with the rest of our team here at Gifford. I could have the meeting in the forum where all of you talk about what Gifford means to you and then close the service line the next week and you could wonder whether you could trust us or we could act with integrity and say, there are hard choices that we all need to talk about. And if people are suffering or feel badly about those choices that we've made, they should talk about them here because we're always going to have an honest conversation with our community. We're going to be the same leaders in every room and act with integrity regardless of what happens with the future of healthcare. And the third thing is Gifford will partner to strengthen our economy and workforce. There is a part of the Oliver Wyman report with which we agree. Vermont has a significant demographic problem. Vermont has a significant housing problem. We need to address those things to make sure areas outside of Chittenden County and Vermont continue to thrive. You know, there's more to health than healthcare services. Gifford has been living this for a long time. That's why we're a federally qualified health center and a medical center in a vibrant retirement community. Sometimes the best medicine is a good job. Sometimes the best medicine is people that care about you and your social life. And so we're really committed to working with other local organizations to say, how can we make a thriving economy where people feel valued and families and businesses can move in? Can we do that work alone? Absolutely not. But you have the, we're not going to look away from Vermont's challenges. We intend to be a leader. So with that, um, my job for the rest of this evening is to facilitate. We wanna hear from you. We have really talented team members here if you have questions. Um, and from now, I look forward to listening and learning to your questions and your experience. All right, now we have people here that are going to get their steps in by running a microphone around. Where are they, Doug, right? Who else, we have Monica? All right, so let's raise your hand, um, share with us, and let's let our policymakers know um, what's on our mind. Also, I would say um, we're open to working with everybody. We did invite the Green Mountain Care Board to this event. Um, they're not here, but we're really grateful for Director of Healthcare Reform, Brendan Krauss, and other state policymakers to be here. Hi, uh, my name is Patrick Conley. I live in Randolph. I work at uh, Vermont State. Um, my partner gave birth to two kids at the birthing center, uh, one a month ago. I, I feel like it's, we're really lucky to have such a nice place uh, within uh, a few minutes drive. Um, I think if something like that, so I, there's a possibility that that might go away. And I think that's a big mistake because it's, it's amazing. Um, the staff at Gifford is really caring and I, I just really appreciate the care that we got. I felt like we were going back in time, and you don't get that type of care anymore. Thank you. Thank you so much. And our birthing center was well, well ahead of its time. And at Gifford, we're talking about how to continue to market that to make sure women know they have choices in their health care, and we'll always be there for them. Hi. <laughs> um, my name is Robin Goodall. I I'm a longtime Randolph resident. Um, full disclosure, I live up on Hospital Hill within a five minute walk of, of Gifford Medical Center. Both of my children were born there and our primary care is located there. Uh, my story is more about access. Um, Central Vermont is a super rural place. There is not accessible health care in many parts of the state. We live in a community that doesn't have a traffic light, where the vast majority of roads are dirt roads, right? So 
getting the help that you need is really important. I have two stories related to that. Um, in 2010, um, I was, <laughs> I fell down in my house and I had, because my legs gave out from underneath me, and some of you know this already, um, I went to the emergency room with, with Ricky, my, you know, with my husband, and met Dr. Josh, <laughs> and who did a lot of really hard work with me and eventually sent me to Dartmouth, where I was diagnosed with Guillain-Barre. Um, that diagnosis led me to two months of a, an elite stay in the ICU at Dartmouth and two months at a vent weaning facility in Massachusetts and six weeks at Fannie Allen Medical Center. I am alive today because of the superior care that I received in the emergency room at Gifford. Um, that he looked at me and looked at all of the things that were going on with me and talked to the folks that he needed to talk to and got me to the place that I needed to be is an amazing gift in my life. That was in 2010. The day that Hurricane Helene ripped its way through Western North Carolina, um, I had gone to my primary care office um, because I had a urinary tract infection. I'm old, you know, you old, older women, we get them. They, they come kind of with the territory, right? And I was prescribed an antibiotic that I have been taking for most of the years of my life, you know, because my record indicates that I'm allergic to penicillin, right? So, you, you know, that limits your life, uh, your, your antibiotic choices a bit. I took it and within an hour, I had a huge rash all over my body. I was having trouble breathing. I couldn't, I was having trouble talking, I was, which is not, a, you know, not a usual thing for me. And I came downstairs and looked at Rick again and said, hey, we have to go to the emergency room. Um, I walked into the emergency room and the nurse there looked at me and said, oh, yeah, I know you and I'm going to keep you alive, you know? And so I got hooked up because I was in, in acute anaphylaxis at that point. It took less than an hour for that to happen. If emergency care in central Vermont gets curtailed in the way that this report suggests that it should, there are a lot of people who are not going to make it out of those situations whole. I am here because it's close by. I mean, really, at my house, it's across the street. But, but if I had had to drive to Dartmouth, or we had had to take the ambulance up to central Vermont, I might not be here telling you this story today. Having care sprinkled throughout the communities of the rural communities of Vermont is mission critical for keeping all of us alive, you know, and that just matters. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and two things that I deeply appreciate of that story. Um, healthcare organizations run on strong nursing teams, and so I just really appreciate a story that highlights our nursing. And then if our medical director, Dr. Josh White, can stand up. Um, we have a great team. Josh has been a leader at Gifford in a long time and was a real leader statewide during COVID, and we really appreciate all his work. Hello. Um, I'm Tom, and uh, this is my wife, Zila, and uh, my 12-year-old uh, son, Lockie. Uh, 12 day, 12 day old block. Oh, um, it, it's we haven't got a lot of sleep. Um, <laughs> spending time uh, coming to a community forum was not the first outing we'd planned for our son, but I think it says something about how important we feel uh, Gifford's birthing center is to us. We had uh, not the easiest time of it, and I think we both feel very strongly that if we had not had the absolute amazing care that we did from the midwives and the doctors and the nurses 
uh, Sealer and Loki would not be here today. And I cannot tell you enough of what, what Gifford means to me. Um, and I think, just sort of for a closing remark for me, I think that the part of the story we're missing is communication. Uh, I've worked in digital comms in Vermont for a long time. And I think that we can reach more people. I think one of our biggest issues, and this is not just Gifford, it's a statewide problem, is that we do not communicate well and people are not aware of services. And I think we can do more to reach people where they are uh, on the services, on the platforms they are, and tell people about the care provided. Um, you know, it's, it's absolutely awe-inspiring. I, mm -hmm. I was also in from a, uh, for a, a, a Goldstone about a month ago, and again, amazing. And, you know, f for me, as I was sitting holding my wife's hand as they did an emergency C-section, you know, where else could I have the, the woman who'd given me the anesthesia uh, was the same one patting me on the back and telling me it was going to be okay. I, I mean, you know, it's a Halloween baby and people under their scrubs were in costume and it, I will never forget this. It was, we, we are so lucky. And um, yeah, it, it means that much. <laughs> So thank you for sharing that. Um, oh boy, I have a 12-year-old and a 10-year-old, and I miss I miss kids that size. So thank you for bringing them. I would just say that that you highlighted one of the things that I find confusing about the report. One of the things the report really says is you can be a hospital or you can get out into the community, and and I don't think that you have to choose. We're a federally qualified health center. We're a hospital. We're a retirement community. I think it's about strengthening our medical center. And then, yes, trying to push out to the community to get people where they are. And I think that's really the challenge that we have before you, before us. So thank you for bringing that up. All right. We have a question over here. Oop, and we have one back here. Hi. Uh, my name is Sophie. Um, I uh, gave birth at the birthing center. Clearly, it mattered a lot to me. Gifford is an unbelievable place. We are so lucky. I grew up in Vermont, and I'm proud to be raising my son in Vermont. People in Vermont talk a lot about community. Often, that doesn't mean a whole lot. But Gifford and the care that I received, my family received at the birthing center, completely redefined what community meant to me. My son is only a few months old, which is maybe why I'm crying, but <laughs> every single person who we came in contact to during the experience of my pregnancy and delivery treated me with unbelievable evidence-based care, but they also treated me like their neighbor, and that mattered even more. I left after the few days you get to spend in the hospital with a brand new baby. I'd never held a newborn before my son was born. And I left feeling confident that I could raise him, that I could take care of him. And I had that confidence because of the care that I received from the midwives and from the nurses and from everybody, from Tom, who brought me French toast two hours after my baby was born <laughs> and said, welcome to the world, little guy. And I'm just so grateful. Um, I think uh, for a lot of people with young kids, coming to a community forum is not an easy thing. A lot of us clearly though are here and there are a lot more of us um, out there. I know I will do every single thing I possibly can to make sure that other mothers are able to have the experience here in our rural communities that I was able to have. I don't think there's a fancy hospital anywhere in the country that would have given me better care than the care I received at the birthing center. So I guess this is me saying, back to my community, thank you, and I will do anything that you need. And I think there's a lot of people who feel the same way. So, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and I will tell you that um, our nursing team would, would point out to you that we do have some of the best quality outcomes of any hospital in Vermont. And when we read the report, um, we were a little distressed to learn that it had misstated the number of births that happened in our community. And um, the research cited for closing small birthing centers, um, you know, people called up the folks that wrote that report 
And the researchers said, no, 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 we're not asking people to close birthing centers. We're talking about the supports necessary to keep them open. And so I think there's a lot to discuss about the birthing center as we go forward into the next legislative session. Hi, my name is Jonathan Hines. I live in Braintree. Um, I've utilized the services of Gifford multiple, well, hundreds of times. Um, on May 7th, 2022, I had a heart attack on my back deck in Braintree. Um, elected officials hear this. I called 911. It didn't work. Okay. That being said, my wife was able to drive me to the hospital, and I found out that this was a heart attack. And DART was right there and took me down to Dartmouth for um, emergency uh, treatment. But without Gifford, I wouldn't be alive today because I wouldn't have had any place to go to get the care I needed. That's one part of this. The other part is this, that the nurses, they're our neighbors. They're people I know. They're people I you know, connect with, I see in the grocery store or whatever. When they yell at me about not taking my meds, I listen. <laughs> uh, I may not listen to a doctor, but I will listen to that nurse <laughs> anyway. I don't think you're alone on that. Uh, and I love, but the point is that I love the community service. We're not just numbers or something on somebody's checklist. We're people that help each other through hard times. And that's Tremendous. So, and, and I would just say, um, you know, I love that your story incorporated what Gifford did to help you and what Dartmouth did to help you. Um, I worked for the state government for a long time in various states and, and started working in healthcare a number of years ago. And I left because I thought, geez, I have all these opinions about healthcare, but I've never actually worked for an organization that cares for humans. So I went out to the Northeast Kingdom and worked at a fairly qualified health center and home health and hospice agency for five years. If you want to find out how healthcare does or doesn't work, like go out to Island Pond on a snowy morning for someone that needs urgent care. Um, and here, I think Vermont's been really focused on big picture healthcare reform. I don't know, it might be time for us to think about how to get people to the right place at the right time. Sometimes it's Gifford, sometimes it's Dartmouth, sometimes it's UVM, sometimes it's the folks at Mass General if you have something that's really, really unusual. But that's a problem that, that I think we should be committed to. How do we get the system to work more like a system and really kind of put people first? So thank you for sharing that. Hi, I'm Barbara Shadler. I live over in Randolph Center, moved to Vermont 15 years ago I chose Randolph Center because I was a retiring professor and I affiliated with the university here and I've done some things with them ever since. But I had an elderly mother too at the time and um, she uh, came to live with me and we were doing fine and we knew that she was 93 and she was having, beginning to have organ issues, right? Gifford was terrific and the night we had to bring it to the emergency room, Gifford did everything. And they then got us in that nice, beautiful room that they have, right? That they have for people, the uh, plant room, or I forget what they call it. <laughs> the, yeah, and um, the whole family came in, even from Massachusetts and Connecticut, and they treated us terrific. And of course, we watched my mother pass away in the most wonderful situation. We, we never would have gotten that down in Massachusetts, quite frankly. Um, and so I'm a great friend of Gifford's for that but also because my doctor's Dr. Bory and he's terrific and uh, I'm standing here today because he helped me a couple of times. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, two very quick notes. You, you, you don't have to go very long at Gifford to hear certain names over and over again like Dr. Bory and Dr. Di Nicola and other people who have spent a long time caring for our community and we're so grateful for them. Uh, also, I want to acknowledge Representative Jay Hooper who's here. Thank you very much for showing up and supporting our community as usual. All right, more questions. We have one down in front. Okay, right here and then down here in the front, second row. Uh, thanks for having this. My name is Ian Sears, a resident. Um, I'm going to uh, ask a question at the end. You know, in the context of micropayments, the way the 
economic shift to funding has happened in the last 15 to 20 years more and more. What what will be we? What can we all do as residents, uh, Randolph and, and further afield, to help with Gifford? Still, interesting. <laughs> Uh, but what I wanted to say was um, the uh, the concept of wealth we often equate to money, and and I think it's for me it's become more the choice of options, um, not just financial, but all the different things that we can choose from. Um, that to me is wealth, and I'm talking about generational wealth here because my family has seen generation after generation not only use Gifford but be born there or pass away there. And the, the familial relationship with the community and the family is strong in so many layered ways um, that the, the needs are not uh, program specific. You know, they are um, probably not advertised as well. Someone else made that point. Um, so I'm just kind of asking, like, what, could we, what recommendations can we do as a smaller uh, granular piece that might help feedback into Gifford might not be financial. So a couple things come right to mind. One, stay engaged, right? The Oliver Wyman report created a moment where people are really paying attention to healthcare, and there's a lot going on locally and nationally, but stay engaged in your local community and in this organization. Um, two, there are people who have made extraordinarily generous gifts uh, to Gifford, and I want to say thank you for that. Um, and it, no gift is too small to support your local hospital. Um, I, I participate every paycheck because I believe in the mission. And so we're really appreciative when people decide to step up and donate. Um, and three, I think we are as a state going to have a pretty significant conversation about affordability um, in the legislature next year. What does that mean? What are we gonna do about it? What does that mean in healthcare? Um, and so I look forward to that and you, you should look forward to that too. When we talk about affordability, I do think that we need to have a nuanced conversation about how much it costs to provide healthcare services and what services people need. Uh, we don't care for people solely to generate revenue. We care for people because they need care. And so next year when we're in the legislature talking about the cost of healthcare and insurance premiums, we're really gonna have to dig deep to figure out what's driving those costs and what's in our control and what's not within our control. Um, hospital rates are within the control of the state of Vermont. Um, the price of specialty drugs, not so much. And so just like, let's stay engaged in that conversation about affordability. All right, I think we have some questions down in front and some back, who's, who's up next here? Thank you, I hope you don't mind, I'm gonna stand over here because I like seeing everyone. Uh, hi, my name is Siobhan, I actually work here at Vermont State, uh, Vermont State University, specifically in residence life. Um, and I wanna bring that up because my first kind of point I wanna bring up is kind of the business side. I depend heavily on this Gifford for the safety of my students. I, as the residence life, or head of residence life, am liable for my students' well-being 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, similar to the medical staff at Gifford. We are extremely fortunate that we are close to Gifford to where if a student is having any medical condition that is not severe to need an ambulance, we can drive them for free to Gifford and pick them up when they are done with their care. If we lose Gifford, we're gonna lose that ability and our students are gonna see much higher costs in their healthcare because the closest we're gonna be able to do is Barry, and that's an ambulance and I don't think I need to explain to anyone that an ambulance costs a million dollars a minute. Uh, um, so for, and also we have a fantastic uh, nursing program here at Randolph and a lot of our students use Gifford as the clinicals. I would hate to lose those students who have brought forth so much care to Vermont, especially during a pandemic. I actually moved to Randolph during the pandemic uh, in 2021, and I was honestly amazed by our students here and what they were learning, and that kind of brings me into my second point of the personal. Uh, the comment of the uh, Halloween baby reminded me that my daughter had RSV on Halloween a few years ago, and it was the worst day of my life. I watched my daughter lying in the bed at Gifford, not breathing, and struggling to take any liquids. And the, ha the doctors were amazing, and I cannot thank them enough, but the staff that really got brought me was I was sitting out in the waiting room, and there was a janitor with, um, dressed up as Jack Skellington, which at the time was my daughter's favorite movie. And I told him that. I'm like, I don't know why, but this is just making me feel a lot better. 
I didn't know that he was in a group costume, and in about five minutes, the entire custodial staff on that night in costume brought the music. They couldn't come into the room because it's a viral, but they played three songs from that movie and lip synced it for my daughter. And it was the only time she smiled that day. And I just, I know we've been thanking the nurses, but I also want to thank the custodial staff because I never really got to thank them that night. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just two quick comments. Um, with, I really appreciate you bringing the perspective of the college because there are ingredients that are necessary for economic vitality. And if we start to take them away, it will be impossible to rebuild them, right? So we want thriving communities. We need this type of anchor here. And then also, I really appreciate your point. Well, we have physicians and nurse practitioners and nurses in the room with patients. It takes an army of people to make a healthcare organization go. And there are people in the audience like Victoria and Environmental Services, Marcelo from our front registration desk, Patrick from facilities. These people are part of the heartbeat of Gifford making it go. And you know, I hate to name some people and not others, but your point is really, really well taken. Thank you. Hello, I'm Randy Garner, uh, past Gifford board chair and uh, for the last quarter of a century local funeral director. And it's actually the latter that my comments are gonna come to you from. And that is that we have noticed an uptick in the past several years of local residents going to far off places for their final days. Uh, most principally Albany, New York. Can't tell you how many times I've been to Albany, New York. Boston, Providence, Rhode Island, Hartford, Connecticut. All these, Manchester, New Hampshire. Why? Because critical care access at Dartmouth was not available. Now we don't have the ability to help that. But when you're looking at critical care access, you have to also look downstream to the step-up units. And we do have the ability to help that. And um, those, some of those patients could be coming back to us. And you talked about this, but I want to expand on it because I think it's really a serious issue. Um, a very close family member of ours is nurse manager manager in critical care at Dartmouth. And I ran this by her and she said, absolutely. We're not doing enough of that. And when patients can't, when the step down unit is full, there's no place to offload critical patients. They can't move down. So beds are often occupied by people who don't actually need them. So if you can offload downstream, because there should really always be a bed or two available in there. Critical care does not function by, oh, we have something, now we need to figure out where we're gonna put them. You know, people come out of surgery. You know, I had a simple surgery that had a little problem. I ended up in there for a little while. Um, they come through the emergency room, you gotta have be ready for this. You can't just develop a plan after a critical patient hits the door. And she said they do this to some extent, but not enough. And I have a suggestion for the state. I'm gonna take your idea and go even further. And that is that the state have a representative, have a, a, a staff person that part of their daily duties is to visit UVM and Dartmouth to talk with discharge planning and oversee and just kind of, because a lot of times these things don't happen, not because somebody it's deliberate, they're busy, they don't get around to it, what have you. But um, to actually work with discharge planning to say, okay, where are we at? We need to get some of these people back to give income both to Gifford and to other hospitals to get the patients back home and also uh, to open up spaces in critical care so we're not having to fly people to Albany, New York. We've darted people from Gifford to, straight to Albany because there was nothing else available. And that sounds really crazy to you. Listen to this. Insurance companies already do this. In the larger cities, they have representatives from Blue Cross or whoever in there working with discharge planners. Whole different motivation. We all know what it is, but it's valid. And they're saying, you know, because they're paying for these people to stay in these critical care units, trying to get people moving through the system when they're trapped there just because somebody 
didn't get around to it. So it's not a crazy idea. I don't think it's enough to rely on the hospitals themselves to get around to it and actually do all of this. Um, one position versus the amount of money we're talking about potentially helping the system is nothing. And, you know, it gives the local hospitals more revenue and local families are not having to sit with their dying loved one looking at beautiful downtown Albany, New York in their final days. I think it's a win-win situation that needs more than just a phone call. It needs a kick in the keister. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, it's so interesting. In Vermont, if there's a flood, there's nobody better at collaborating and helping their neighbor. Uh, if there's a fire in town, there's nobody better at helping collaborate their neighbors. Something happens to one of your family members, your friends and neighbors are going to be there. H healthcare's got to have that spirit. That should be Vermont's superpower, how to collaborate. And I guess I would understand the report better if Dartmouth and UVM weren't full. But they are full. And so that's a formidable problem that we're all going to have to work through. And we're really committed to it. Our first question from the bleachers. I'm in the cheap seats. My name is Melissa Scalera, and I was an OBGYN who worked at Gifford. And um, when I, 10 years ago, was thinking about coming to some place to work as an OBGYN, I had many choices. I interviewed in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Michigan. And Gifford had the most amazing birthing unit. I can tell you I've practiced obstetrics for 20 years all over the world, literally. And Sophie is absolutely right. There is no place better in the world to deliver than Gifford Hospital. And this is coming from somebody who knows. Um, the combination of excellent care, evidence-based care, with people who know you, your friends, your neighbors, your family who care for you, who see you regularly, who know you, who listen to you, which is so important nowadays because women are not listened to. And I can only quote Marge Myers, who was the then chair of obstetrics at UVM. She said the world would be a better place if all babies were born at Gifford Hospital. I don't want to take too much time, but I can also tell you um, that now I'm kind of on the other end of the spectrum. I've been doing some hospice and palliative care work. Um, just part of being in the community, I have personally taken six friends and neighbors to the emergency room and family members to the emergency room at Gifford in the last couple of years. And um, I just plumped them in my car from you know my friend's mother who I saw having chest pain on North Main Street to a friend who when we were shooting pool, thought he was having a stroke, um, to a guy in a parking lot that I didn't even know who pitched on his face and was bleeding. Um, and it's so easy to just plunk somebody in your car and take them to Gifford, as, as Siobhan said, as opposed to you know having to get an ambulance and go to Dartmouth, where in February of this year, their waiting, air, their waiting time in the ER was two to four hours. Instead, you just walk in. Um, also, just the cost of ambulances. I don't know, this, this guy who wrote this report, he's from New York City and he got like a million dollars, is that right? Um, I don't think he's ever driven the Roxbury Gap in February. Yeah. They just, they I, don't uh, get Vermont. I'd be happy to drive him up there. <laughs> you and me both. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on yeah. his underwear afterward, but <laughs> yeah. Um, finally, the other, the last thing is just um, one of the people I took to the hospital one night was my mother-in-law, who was literally dying. We couldn't control her pain, and she wound up in the garden room. And the garden room is just an amazing place. I, I did have to call the ambulance, um, but two minutes drive, she was there. She was checked in, she was warm, she was cared for by our friends and neighbors and surrounded by love. Um, she, she was from New Jersey, I brought her up here literally because I knew that there was no better place to end your, 
to start your life or to end your life in Gifford. And she wound up in the garden room and just all of our friends and neighbors were there. And it was just such an amazing experience. It, I couldn't have thought of a better, a better place, as I said, to begin or end your life. So thank you. Thank you. Um, and I am a believer in every situation there's a silver lining. And so honestly, my biggest fear with the Act 167 report was that we'd have team members leave. And you know, a healthcare organization runs on people. You gotta have the people. And we've had people leave and we've had people who were recruiting say, no, this is too much uncertainty. But you know, I think the silver lining is this. There are people now with all the uncertainty at the federal level and locally who are really looking in the mirror and saying, what's my purpose? You know, local institutions are gonna matter more than ever. What's my purpose? And we had three amazing clinical candidates interview with us last week. We've already had a physician say yes, and so I think we are, we're starting to find our people. There are people that want to sign up because they know they can make a difference in people's lives at a critical access hospital and a fairly qualified health center. So thank you for sharing that. Where's the next question coming from? Oh, right up top, and then we have some in the middle and in front. So my name is Jen Colby. Um, I was, this is the full circle as well, I was born at Gifford when my dad was a VTC student in 1970, and my son was born here as well, and my husband as well. Um, but to, to talk about the other end of life a little bit, um, pre-garden room, um, several weeks ago, my mom needed an ER visit. She and her cat had had an altercation. She had a huge bite on her leg. Her leg blew up like crazy. Her GP is down in Woodstock, and she really wanted to see him because she loved him because I can't get her to transfer up to Gifford. <laughs> Bummer. But in his conversation with her, he said, when an older person gets a lower leg injury, it is so challenging. Often it is a decline in the end of their life. It is something that can interfere with their ability to live independently. And the care that she got at the Gifford ER was amazing. It was quick. She is well on her way to healing. This is the kind of care that can allow someone to live independently, which isn't necessarily something that ends up in a report, but it is something that does not unnecessarily drain the medical system when a person can live on their own even longer. So. I'm still driven to get her to change her GP up here, but in the meantime, I am grateful that she lives two minutes away from the hospital for when she needs it. So thank you all. I'm Gene Krause and I live in Bethel. Uh, a completely different kind of comment. Mm -hmm. the, you talked about affordability. The way we finance health care in this country stinks. Imagine if you had no insurance bills, health insurance, and you had that money, you, may, you paid more taxes, but you didn't have health care to worry about. Mm -hmm. My plea is to all of us in this room that we take seriously the needs not just here in this community which are staggering but that we take into consideration affordability for health care and access to health care that is quality health care universally nationwide thank you very much Um, hello there. My name is Dakota Harrington. Uh, I go by Coda. Um, I live here in Randolph Center, and I just wanted to really drive home some experiences that other people have had, as well as myself. Um, I, w I had appendicitis this summer, um, which, if any of you have had it, is not a fun experience. Zero stars don't recommend it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I 
know that if Gifford Medical wasn't so close and accessible, I would not have caught my appendicitis before my appendix burst, and I had a lot more issues than just the swelling. You know, there would have been, you know, stuff all over the inside that would have needed to be cleaned up, etc. But, you know, one of my biggest fears with anything in the like the medical world is surgery. It's horrifying to me. I I get nervous, depressed, etc. just even like thinking about it and I've had to have it a couple of times and it never gets better. And I was able to meet with Dr. Sokolovsky and his team and they were able to just put me at ease. It was something that once I met them, I was just like, these people get it. I trust them. They care about people. And I know he, he won me over when he uh, said that uh, if he had to, he would go in with his bare hands and take it out. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I would do his Russian accent, but I'm not as good as it, at it as he is. Um, but I also wanted to attest to the... Um, the efficiency of Gifford Medical as well. I've been to emergency rooms before in other hospitals, and my most recent experience before Gifford, it took six hours before who I was with was even seen, let alone my most recent experience where within that time frame, I was already out of surgery and starting recovery. That's incredible, and I think that that's something that can't be... That's something that you can't put a price tag on, you know? And I think that sometimes when these studies are done, they don't look at things like that. They don't look at the value of people's time. And that's insane. You know, hospitals do need to make money, but most importantly, they need to save people. They need to make sure people are feeling comfortable. And Gifford does that like no other place I've experienced. And judging by a lot of people's stories, I think you all agree with me. You know, when I got my surgery, I felt like I was the most important person in the world. And I don't think that I'm alone in feeling that way. And I just want to be clear, we're not pulling a appendices out with hands. <laughs> I haven't been to uh, too many surgical meetings, but I think that's true. Um, before we have the next question, I just want to acknowledge one other person here. Uh, Vermont's healthcare advocate, Mike Fisher, is here. Um, thank you very much for coming and listening. Um, Mike and the folks at Vermont Legal Aid do a great job representing Vermonters in a complex healthcare system. So thank you. My name is Holly Gesson. I live in Brookfield, Vermont. I'm 66, and I have a lot of friends who are getting older. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. There are a lot of new knees in Brookfield, Vermont, <laughs> and they were all done at Gifford. But the reason I'm standing up now is the young man who just spoke before me talked about surgery, and my mom has had a lot of surgery at Gifford. The follow-up has been incredible. The next morning, she's in the bed, and surgeons are coming to look at her wounds to make sure it's being cleaned the correct way. After a knee surgery, most people go to Kingwood for their rehab, but she needed a little extra help. So the rehab was right in the hospital until she was well enough to go to Kingwood. They really take care of the patient, and if some people need extra help, Gifford provides it. Thank you so much. Then we also have some on that side of the room. Go right ahead. Hi, my name is Beth Dolly, and currently I live in Stockbridge. I was born in Gifford. I was taken home to Pond Village in Brookfield. I, as I said, I'm now living in Stockbridge. I have progressed in my life to the point where I'm now the Stockbridge representative to the White River Valley Ambulance. Um, Gifford 
has been a part of my life all of the years I've been alive. And I gotta tell you, the last time I stood in this gym, I was a cheerleader for the VTC <laughs> basketball team. So, you know, we got, we got some, we got Welcome some miles back. here. Yeah, um, would have been a lot more comfortable with the carpet. Gifford takes care of everybody, no matter what. My mother had a stroke. I drove her to the hospital. We walked into the ER. Dr. Burry took care of it. I had an AFib attack. I walked into the ER and they said, what's up? And I said, yeah, there's something going on in my chest. Things moved. Um, <laughs> you're not gonna get that in other places. Tomorrow, I am taking my best friend to Burlington for a consultation for a cataract removal. And the reason we're doing that is because they can't do anything for her at Dartmouth-Hitchcock for 18 months. We can't afford, in more ways than one, to have that kind of delay. I have read nowhere near enough of that report to make a lot of opinions, but what I have read has left me with the feeling that whoever hired that man gave him a directive to figure out a way to make all the business go to Dartmouth and UVM Medical Center. And I have... 10 or 15 years ago, I worked with someone in Massachusetts, friend I went, I ultimately got my degree at Norwich in, in Northfield as a civilian. And one of my classmates worked in healthcare and they were interested in bringing a service to Vermont. And so I went through the medical board and got some information for him. And at the end of reading it all and going to it with him, I said, you know, this is all written so that the only people who get any chance to have services in Vermont are people who go to UVM Medical Center. They get to say yay or nay. I'm sorry, we can't let that happen. Thank you. Um, just one response to that. Uh, you know, Brendan Krauss is in the room. He's the director of healthcare reform. And the legislature did put a process in motion with Act 167. Step one of that process was for the Green Mountain Care Board with help from Oliver Wyman to do its report evaluating Vermont's healthcare system and to come up with a set of recommendations. And now we have those recommendations. They are not mandates, but they're out there and they're shaping the conversation. The next step of Act 167 is for Vermont's Agency of Human Services to work with Vermont's hospitals and healthcare providers on a feasibility analysis. So what are we gonna do next? And I think it's really important to understand that. Um, I think the strong message we're trying to send to our state partners is, we know we need to have that conversation. We're willing to have that conversation. Gifford wants to be a leader in that conversation, but we don't want to start from the premise that those recommendations are the right recommendations. Let's all work together to figure out what makes sense. Because I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Like, Making enough money to keep rural hospitals open is a significant challenge. It cannot be wished away. But we want to start from the premise that we're all focused on how this could work instead of here's why it doesn't work. And so I trust that the Scott administration, Secretary Samuelson, and Brendan are going to run a fair process that's going to give us the opportunity to make that case that you've described. Um, I didn't understand fully what you said you were shutting down. Two services, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know which health care providers, I don't mean my name, but type, will be affected and where the services will be um, obtained by our uh, people. Yep, that's an excellent question. And so earlier I did talk about Gifford's decision to close down two service lines. So one is urogynecology and the other is chiropractic services. So urogynecology services are in both um, Berlin and Randolph. Um, and we have a great urology team and gynecology team. And so what Dr. White and his colleagues did was try to move patients that are with that physician, because there's one physician who's a urogynecologist, to other medical providers. Now, chiropractic services, we have two chiropractors and they practiced out of Sharon, right? And so the decision we made affected three clinical staff members, two chiropractors and Sharon, 
and one urogynecologist in Berlin and Randolph. Um, and then we were able to take all the support staff, because nobody works alone, and provide them with other opportunities within Gifford, because we have open positions with Gifford. If you have talented friends and family, please apply. Um, and so I'm really sad for our colleagues that, that need to move on to the next phase of their career. Um, but you know, it's affecting three clinicians and their patients. In the case of urogynecology, we think we can cover that. In the case of chiropractic services, we're telling folks there are other options out in the community and we're trying to navigate them to other chiropractic services. I'm, I, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Like, that's really hard for them and it's really hard for patients and it's disruptive for our team. We're only making decisions like that because the moment demands it, that we take action um, so we can focus on our core business and demonstrate to the state that we're serious. In this moment, we're not gonna put our head in the sand. We're gonna take a look right at the problem and try to do our best to strengthen Gifford. I hope that helps. We've got questions down here and then over here in front. Oh, I guess we have one of the bleachers. Hi, Julie Ithund. I'm uh, a resident of Randolph. I'm also the director of the Randolph Area Community Development Corporation. And I guess uh, I, I am not and never will be uh, a healthcare expert. Thank you very much for all the work you do to do that. But I, I just did want to um, say a few words about the concept of a community because I think what gets lost often in conversations about one institution or another institution, we were here not too long ago talking about this institution, and now we're talking about the hospital, but and it, 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 10 years ago, you know, we do, we do housing, and we also host the SASH program, which is a senior wellness program. 10 years ago, we were told we had enough affordable housing. What we really need is jobs. Well now, as you well know, we have lots of jobs, but we don't have enough housing. And you can't do these things on a dime. You can't turn a switch and get institutional changes like this. You can't turn a switch and get an institution or get a housing project. And I think what's lost sometimes is that the community is all these things, right? This community was built around our institutions and our institutions were built around this community. And when investment on housing is looked at, you can't believe the things we check off, we have to check off. The, our state is investing housing money where there are institutions, right? And you, if you pluck that out, you have just invested millions and millions of dollars to house people close to these services that you're taking away. Our land use you know, policies direct development outside of green space to these central locations like Randolph, these job centers, these community centers that serve their peripheral, more rural lands. You can't just pluck things out and expect you know, everything to be the same. Communities are built intertwined with each other. And part of the reason you, know, you can't spit in Randolph without you know, meeting a nurse <laughs> is because you know, we have a nursing program here and we have a hospital there and we have you know, the people that you've been talking about. Should we, can we do better to make this more affordable? I'd say yes, we need more services with our, you know, we need the, 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 you know, the social determinants to focus on as well as the, the medical, uh, you know, interventions. But, but, you know, I'm begging people, <laughs> begging people, please, don't think about communities in isolation or institutions in isolation this way. We are not in this isolation. We can't be. And if you pluck one out without thinking about the impacts on the rest, you have undermined a lot of uh, both you know, financial investment and human investment in that community. So uh, you know, obviously we don't want anything bad to have to happen to our hospital, but I think we also have to think about the ecosystem of our community and how, how we help keep this intact and grow it together. So thank you very much. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Donna Bryan. I live in Stockbridge. We're very blessed to have the Gifford organization within 15 to 20 minutes. The next closest for us would be Berlin or Dartmouth. Um, Gifford goes back, my family goes back with Gifford for many, many years. I have three older siblings, the oldest one born at home, but then the next one, 72 years ago, was born at Gifford and the other two of us since. Most recently, over the years, we've made wonderful friends and from Gifford having to use the facility. There is no hospital in the area with no more highly qualified, compassionate, capable people than the ones that are within the Gifford walls. And it doesn't matter if it's from LNAs up through the people, our, the consummate professionals, they are talented, they are compassionate, empathetic people. Most recently, in 2022, I had the, I was at Gifford for a while. I had lost my husband in April of 22, and I spent the week before his celebration of life at Gifford. I had a blockage that caused some other problems. I was discharged a couple of nights before the celebration with the understanding that I would be back there. And Dr. Sokolovsky had said he really didn't want to see me back there on an emergency basis. Well, that's what happened. I put it off in July. I ended up with a perforated intestine and by the time my sisters found me, I had sepsis. It had been a couple of days. Had it not been for the professionals at Gifford, I would not be here today. I didn't have the time to go to Dartmouth, and it's a bit of a joke in my family now because my sister says, had I been able to make that decision or somebody had told me they were taking me to Dartmouth, I'd have thrown a fit. We have had wonderful care, and we should all be blessed and very thankful for the individuals that keep that going. You can't get better food anywhere, better care. It's like a five star, you know. It's just wonderful, and the people in it are tremendous people. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm also informed that at one point in time, our cafeteria Gifford was the highest rated lunch spot on Yelp and Randolph. Um, it is still quite lovely. Hi, my name is Emily Lewis. Uh, I moved to Randolph almost five years ago. Uh, I moved in January of 2020. It was a great time to meet people. <laughs> Um, but one of the few people I did meet outside of my coworkers was Jenny. Um, and when I had my son a year later, I can't tell you how much it meant to me to know someone personally when I was at Gifford giving birth. And that's one of the things that I think is amazing about this community. Um, you know, Vermont is an aging population, and I think one of the things that helps attract young people to Vermont is institutions and places like Gifford. It's one of the reasons why I knew pretty quickly I wanted to stay in Randolph uh, after we moved here. Um, every time we drive past Gifford, my three-year-old son points, at, points to him and goes, Mom, that's where I was born. <laughs> um, and uh, like the gentleman that spoke earlier, I also uh, got to see Dr. Sokolovsky for an appendectomy this year. Um, <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. I just knew I was in pain and drove myself at 4 a.m. five minutes to Gifford, texted my husband to let him know uh, where I had gone. And he woke up not very happy with me. <laughs> but the fact that I could do that, uh, if I had had to go up to Berlin or down to Dartmouth, I wouldn't have done that. And it would have been a much worse situation. And so I'm truly grateful for uh, having that so close here. Thank you so much. Nick, we've got some questions, Doug, down in front here. Right here. Hi, everyone.
everyone. My name is Casey Reibolts. I'm embarrassed to say I was not born at Gifford Hospital, <laughs> but my son was, so I think that counts. Um, I have had a primary care doctor most of my life, um, and I've been an employee of theirs, and now I'm a community partner that refers people to Gifford every day. <laughs> um, so my question is actually, we've talked about what services will be leaving. I'm curious to know what services we're entertaining to add to Gifford's. Uh, so yeah, their portfolio. What are, what are we looking to add? Well, so thank you very much for that, um, that question. We have not had that conversation, but sometimes um, the universe gives you the right thing at the right time. We're supposed to begin strategic planning at the beginning of 2025. It seems like an enormous opportunity for Gifford to be planning for the future in this moment. I think our idea is over the next 90 days, we need to figure out exactly where we're at financially, because there's, there's a big challenge there. Um, what we can do to make sure that our current services are caring for people and generating enough revenue that we can make sure that Gifford is secure and stable. And then from there, ask what our community needs. Federally qualified health centers across the country are sort of amazing, right? They serve um, about one in nine people nationwide, one in three people in Vermont, and they do lots of different things. And so it's a great time. It's one of the things the report gets right is it's a great time to think about what we should look like in the future and what that means for our community. So I don't have that answer right now, but it's top of mind as we go into strategic planning for 2025. Good evening, I'm Paul Kendall from Braintree and also a past chair of Gifford Medical Center. I would like to share with you a few thoughts as to why I love Gifford. My thoughts will really only echo a lot of the personal stories that we've heard so far tonight, but they will come to those stories from a more historical perspective. In 1905, two years after Dr. Gifford started his hospital. Gifford Hospital, not then known as Gifford Hospital, founded the first nurse training center in rural Vermont. And for over 50 years, it graduated almost 200 nurses, some of whom stayed here in Randolph and may have been some of your mothers or grandmothers, but they also served throughout the region in World War I and in World War II, something that Gifford should be very, very proud of. In the 1970s, Gifford opened the first birthing center in Vermont, making available to women the opportunity to choose where and how they would give birth, whether at home with the aid of a midwife or at home with the supervision of a physician. A few years later, the Gifford trustees adopted a new admission policy to Gifford called Income blind. What that meant was that for those members of our community who did not have the financial resources to pay a doctor for the services that they needed, they could come to Gifford, receive, receive that, the care that they needed, and the doctor did not have to worry about how he or she would be paid. That's something that we really should applaud. And finally, about 20 years ago, Gifford raised its hand to take over the management of Tranquility Nursing Home. Tranquility Nursing Home was housed in what we currently called Kimball House at the end of Randolph Road, where 
Sap Restaurant currently is. It was then owned and managed by a private individual who had run it into the ground so badly that the state was threatening to close it down, not having any place to put the 50 plus or minus elders who were currently living there. Gifford raised its hand and said no. We will take over the license to operate that nursing home and manage it appropriately. And what has happened over the past 20 or so years? Do you know what Tranquility Nursing Home is today? It is Gifford's award-winning Minig Center at Morgan Orchards. Another thing that we should be very proud of. All of these responses to community need, to emerging community need, to needs that were not identified by anybody else, were made by Gifford because of its independence and its financial strength. Independence and financial strength. Michael has mentioned several times this evening whether we agree with the details of the Wyman report or not, that Gifford does change, does face financial challenges, and I have every confidence that the leadership of Gifford will meet those challenges creatively and proactively so that in the future, Gifford will be, remain independent, financially strong enough to continue to meet the emerging needs of our community. Normally I would stop here, but another thought has been raised during the discussions, and that is the environment around the state or within the state that Gifford must operate it within. And that's the affordability crisis for health care across the state. This may be out of line, but it's occurred to me, Michael, that even if Gifford does all the wonderful things to right its ship, it's not even, I shouldn't say right its ship, but to continue, to continue uh, developing its strength and independence, its efforts will not affect the overall affordability of health care in Vermont more than one penny. It is my view that if in the long run we wish to, to control health care costs in the state of Vermont, the legislature must mandate that Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurers reimburse primary care services on a par with hospital-based services. Gifford, of course, is both a primary care leader and a hospital. Why do I say that? Because it's obvious. We all know it. The lower cost of providing health care to, to individuals in their home through primary care, ambulatory care, outpatient care, all of the community services that support primary care is far, far cheaper than one night stay in a hospital. I am delighted to hear Michael speak repeatedly tonight of how proactively and creatively Gifford leadership is going to get us through. I think we should applaud that and support that and expect that. And we also should support and expect that our late legislature will do the right thing as well. Thank you.
The legislature just gave me a note. Well, I think I better not read it. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Um, I really appreciate your comments. When I was interviewing at Gifford, I said to our senior leadership team, I expect you to be leaders in healthcare reform. Today, I said, I expect us to be leaders working with the state in healthcare reform. And what I'll add to that based on Paul's comments is everybody who got Gifford here over the last 100 years expects us to be leaders in healthcare. And so thank you so much. Other comments? Oh, we got one right here, one right there. And I think we have a note from one of our physicians who couldn't be here tonight. That I will be very short and very sweet. You've talked about the job that you all have in front of you. And my question is, well, before the question, you have a lot of friends here. The question is, how do we help? Thank you so much. I. When you ask how you can help, um, stay engaged. Talk to your legislators. When you talk to your legislators, um, ask them to make sure that it's up to Gifford to remain independent. One of our significant fears is that the Green Mountain Care Board will use its budget process to simply decide that Gifford should not do certain things anymore. That's not the way it ought to be. Um, two, encourage everybody you know to move here. Um, Advocate for affordable housing. We have people that want to come work for Gifford. They simply cannot find a place to live, right? That sounds simple, but we've all been to meetings in Vermont about housing. It can be really tough. Um, and then, um, you know, keep with this story, because I think we're gonna learn a lot over the next three months, six months, nine months, about what we need to do to engage in change, right? It can't just be one meeting here today. Um, although I have no way to properly express to all of you what this meeting has meant to us to see your support tonight. Hi, I'm Dr. Josh White. Uh, unfortunately, some of you have had to visit the ER and may know me personally. Everybody's glad I'm there. Nobody wants to see me. Um, I have a, a statement uh, sent to me by uh, Dr. Bruce Andrus cardiologist at Gifford who couldn't attend. Uh, before I get into that, a quick comment. Um, for, if there's anyone in the audience who is negatively impacted by our decision to close uh, uh, chiropractic services, um, uh, I want to acknowledge your pain. I know Ashley has received some negative comments and I, I know this negatively affected people. And we have a, a mandate to the community to support the whole, but I don't want to pretend that there were individuals that are not suffering. If you are one of those people and you're interested, I want you to invite you to call me, Ashley, or come to myself. Uh, I'll get you my office phone number, uh, and I would like to hear your story, and I would like to talk about what we can do to fill that gap. Dr. Anderson's note. Good evening, good evening, folks. I'd like to explain why preserving Gifford is important. I'm a Gifford cardiologist who works part-time at DHMC. Previously, I was a Dartmouth cardiologist who worked part-time at Gifford. I know both institutions well. As a small community hospital, I believe Gifford is a crucial component of the ecosystem. While large tertiary medical centers best deliver intensive care and complex high-risk surgeries and procedures, Small community hospitals provide easily accessible, friendly, reliable, and competent primary and secondary care. Continuity of care is much greater. You're much more likely to reach a familiar voice on the phone. You're more likely to be cared for by clinicians who understand where you're coming from. Trust and familiarity are built more easily in a community hospital. I'm concerned that closing the inpatient unit would undermine the presence of convenient specialty and surgical care currently available at Gifford. Procedures and operations can often be done very safely outside of an academic center that do require having inpatient beds. Closing the inpatient unit would force many patients and their families to travel an hour or more to large, confusing hospitals for relatively simple problems. I could not attend this meeting because I'm caring for my wife, who had a knee replacement at Gifford yesterday. 
she gave me permission to share this. <laughs> she decided to have her surgery at Gifford, even though we live closer to Dartmouth, because surgery could be done much sooner here, because we knew that she would receive excellent care and have a more pleasant patient experience. That's all, thank you. Dr. Bruce Andrus. We have time for a few more comments and questions. I, I knew Dr. Andrus was a tremendous cardiologist. I didn't know he was a great writer too. And so what a story. Hi, I am Jill Floyd. I'm here from Randolph Center. And kind of a question that's kind of come up and mm -hmm. hearing from a few others talk about the aging population here, the step-down units that are needed, talking about Manning Nursing Home. Um, kind of a thought I've had is if Gifford and BTC, Vermont State University, whatever you want to call it now, and Norwich, being that they both have nursing programs, have thought about working together to open up an assisted living. I know there's been some dorm spaces over the times that are not being fully utilized, um, utilized here on campus or in other areas, that working together, giving students real life experience with maybe not heavily needed medical necessary people that are needing an assisted living care, need a little extra help, can't stay in their home after a surgery or something. Um, if that thought has ever crossed any of the campus's minds or something to think about knowing that you're looking to grow more areas. Uh, I really appreciate your suggestion. Uh, I have not been here for very long, but I think the only way through in a situation like this is by having friends. It's by having a sense of community. And so we stand ready to work with other partners to imagine what the community could look like and how we can work together. Uh, I do think that, as I said at the beginning, thriving communities are a big part of creating health and healthcare. And so we want to work with others on ideas like that. Thank you. All right, we have one down here and then maybe one more. And as we've said repeatedly tonight, we're not going anywhere, so we're happy to answer additional questions over time. Hello, I hope I don't take too much of your time, but I thank you as a resident of South Round um, for all of you being out here tonight to support our Gifford Hospital Medical Center. Um, my husband and I were married 50 years ago. He's a lifelong resident of South Royalton. I'm a Flatlander, and I was born in New York, and I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but 43 years ago, uh, Kenneth Morey became our primary care physician. I don't want to talk about Ken. You could all figure it all out yourselves. But because of relying upon his expertise, his development as a doctor along with Gifford, our family, our children, our grandchildren, and other folks within our expanded family, have over the years depended upon what Gifford has to offer. In 1988, because of the care at the Gifford Medical Center, I was determined not to have cancer. And so therefore, I was able to go home with um, great joy. In 1918, the wonderful care at Gifford, we actually discovered I did at that point have cancer. I was treated, I've been cancer free for six years, but it's because of the care, the initial care, the diagnostic care that was provided at Gifford Medical Center that all of that was possible. We sometimes forget that there are trends, there are developments, but there are um, storage, stories which last decades. I just hope that we remember as we discuss the needs of the community of Gifford that we also discuss the needs of the employees of Gifford. One of my concerns is that we have so many people who provide that care, who are employees, we need to consider their health and their home life, their community, as much as we consider the community of the patients. There are other things, but I don't want to take up any more of your time. From my perspective, I just think we, it's a good start this is an excellent start, and I hope this happens more. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I would say that we have something in common. I'm about six generations away from being a real Vermonter. 
Um, but I moved here and we're never leaving. We're now on a dirt road, which makes me feel like I have a little more credibility. Um, but I appreciate you bringing up our team. I think one of the most difficult parts of the report was the impact on our team to have to work with that uncertainty. And so we're excited to look forward and move ahead. I would say the last comment of the night, given the time. I want to be respectful of people's time. Hi. Uh, my name is Lisa Manning Floyd. I'm the principal at Randolph Union High School. And I've heard a lot about community. Um, neither schools nor hospitals exist without community. And I just wanted to share a lot about what Gifford means to my school community. Um, Gifford has meant a lot to me personally, but in my professional life, I see students every day who may or may not be able to access health care without the support that Gifford provides. We have a nurse practitioner provided by Gifford who sets up her office in our school three days a week so that students whose families maybe are working two or three jobs and can't access health care um, outside of their work day can ensure that their students are receiving what they need at school. Veggie Van Gogh, which started during COVID, exists at Gifford. Um, well, I guess it was a little bit before COVID that it started. Um, and we were fortunate enough that when I reached out to Ashley and um, another community partner who worked at Gifford, they worked with our students to help them pick up food for residents of the Randolph House in town and deliver it. And I think now Gifford has taken that over because during COVID, they didn't want our students coming into those spaces where vulnerable populations live. Gifford provides jobs for our families. They provide mental health services, which are so desperately needed right in our communities. And our cessation policies at school were drafted in coordination with people from Gifford who helped us um, do that work and make sure that we were really focused on supporting students who had become addicted to nicotine um, through vape, et cetera, um, stop being addicted to vape and that it was not an overly punitive stance from our school. In addition, um, we've been offered prevention support through Gifford and that partnership is tremendously helpful. It's one thing when your principal stands up and says, you shouldn't do that, it's not healthy. It's another thing when your pediatrician is working with the school to do that. And I also want to share, um, many of you probably heard this last year, our building is aging. Um, and last year we had a challenging situation. We had an electrical failure right at the end of the school year. And we had to give AP exams. Without any second thought, our, our friends at Gifford offered up um, conference rooms, offered up a conference room at Menig for us to give our AP exams because the college board actually doesn't really care um, whether or not you have an emergency happening. Those tests are to be, livered, to be delivered on a schedule. So our students were able to take those tests on time because of the wonderful community partnership that we have with Gifford. I just appreciate you all so much and I'm so glad that you continue to be a part of our community. One other piece is that when I read that report, I knew that there was some flawed data in there. And when working with students, we talk to them all the time about reliable data. And it really concerns me that big decisions might be being considered with flawed data. Thank you. Thank you. So perhaps the two most important words I'll say tonight, thank you. Thank you for sharing your time with us. Thank you for sharing your stories with us. Um, honestly, thank you for sharing your lives with us. It is an honor for people at Gifford to take care of their neighbors and their communities. Um, you should expect to hear from us again. Uh, you should know the leadership team at Gifford and everybody there is all in and on task, ready to partner with the state of Vermont, the Green Mountain Care Board and anyone else to have a discussion about what it means to redefine rural health care and to make sure that our communities get what they need and make sure that decisions about services in our community stay with our community. Um, our goal is exactly what Paul articulated. We aim to be independent and financially strong and in a position to help when our community needs it. It's been the story of Gifford for over 100 years and we'd like it to continue for another 100. 
I'm happy to stay and answer your questions, but most importantly, thank you and have a wonderful night. Thank you.